So I get the question all the time, what does genetic counseling mean? Very few people know what genetic counseling means, and even fewer people know what they do. So just as a little background, genetic counselors have advanced training in human genetics and counseling, um, and we work in a variety of settings. I work here at Schroeder Hospital in Helena in the medical genetics department, and I work with an incredible group of people. I work with brilliant geneticists, a wonderful nurse navigator, other genetic counselors, a nutritionist, a psychologist, and an incredible lab staff. And together, we try to find answers for families. We have a unique model here at Shodair. We actually see most of our patients at outreach sites around the state, including on reservations. So we take our services to the patients, which we find very valuable. And particularly because we're able to provide cutting-edge services to patients who are largely underserved. So, have you ever stood there with your hand on a door handle, repeating in your mind what you're about to tell someone, and taking a couple deep breaths, knowing that you're about to give someone news that will change their life forever? Have you ever held a phone to your ear and paused to hit the last number, knowing that the person on the other end of the call will hear news that will change their life forever? These are not uncommon situations for me as a genetic counselor. For me, this might mean telling you that your fetus has Down syndrome, your newborn has cystic fibrosis, your child's autism is due to an underlying genetic condition, your parent has Huntington's disease, you have a genetic predisposition to cancer. And while I adore working with all of the uh, patients we see in genetics, I've developed a special interest in cancer genetics. And I want to tell you about a patient named Mary. So Mary was referred to, uh, to genetics at age 47 due to her family history of breast and ovarian cancer. Mary's doctor was wondering if there could be an underlying genetic cancer predisposition syndrome in her family for which Mary could also be at risk. So when I met with Mary, we reviewed her family and personal histories. And based on that information, we discussed her lifetime risk of breast cancer. In her case, her number was greater than 20%, which qualified her for breast MRI screenings in addition to mammograms. So regardless of whether she chose to test or not, her screening could be altered accordingly. At that time, we also reviewed genetics in general. We reviewed the genetics of cancer, and that 5 to 10% of all cancer is due to an underlying genetic predisposition. We discussed various genetic testing options available to her, that it was her right to test or not to test, and what results, if she did choose to test, would and would not mean for her. Finally, we discussed inheritance and what results might mean for her two adult daughters. Based on our discussion, Mary decided to pursue genetic testing for the two most common breast and ovarian cancer genes, known as BRCA1 and BRCA2. Many of you may already be familiar with the BRCA genes. They work together as tumor suppressors, and when they function normally, they help our bodies prevent cancer, particularly in the breasts and in the ovaries. When there's a change in one of those genes, it causes a genetic condition called hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, or HBOC for short. About one in 300 people has HBOC. And if you remember back to 2013, a phenomenon we now call the Angelina Jolie effect swept the media. Angelina Jolie went public with her choice to pursue genetic counseling and genetic testing based on her family history of cancer. Angelina wrote that she had tested positive for a mutation and that she had decided to pursue a prophylactic mastectomy. Since that time, referrals to cancer genetics clinics have drastically increased. Testing for the BRCA genes has doubled. And in my mind, even more importantly, discussions among family members were enabled. And that's exactly what happened with my patient Mary, who was sitting around her holiday dinner table and talking with her relatives, realized that some of the so-called female cancers in her family were actually ovarian, and that many more women had been diagnosed with breast cancer than she'd realized. It is then that she requested a referral to come see us in genetics. 
So there I stood at the doorway, catching my breath and rehearsing in my mind what I was about to say, knowing that I would go in the room and give Mary news that would change her life forever. When I went in, I told Mary that she had tested positive or that a disease mutation had been identified in her BRCA1 gene. Her lifetime risk of breast cancer was up to 85%. Her risk of ovarian cancer was up to 40%. We discussed options available to her, knowing this diagnosis, including increased screening, uh, surgery, and medication management. We also discussed that her daughters had a 50% chance of also inheriting that mutation from her. Our role as genetic counselors is really to promote patient autonomy, or to enable patients to make their own decision. We work within the patient's own culture, a belief system, level of understanding, and expectations to ensure that they're making the best decision for him or herself. Whether for Mary, this means deciding between increased screening or surgery. In other cases, it might mean helping a young adult recently diagnosed with Huntington's disease, which career might be most appropriate. It might mean helping a pregnant patient figure out how to manage her very high-risk pregnancy. Often, it's helping parents of a child with autism or other developmental delays decide which local resources might help them the most. And so based on our discussion, Mary chose to, to schedule a follow-up appointment with her doctor. At that point, she was scheduled for a repeat mammogram, a breast MRI, and ovarian cancer screening. When she was meeting with her doctor, Mary mentioned that she'd been having symptoms, like bloating and lower back pain which she thought was due to stress from receiving the genetic, genetic diagnosis. You fast forward a couple weeks, and Mary was diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is the deadliest of the gynecological cancers, and Mary died within a month of that diagnosis. Since that time, I've been working with Mary's two adult daughters, who also happen to be identical twins. One of her daughters wants to know her genetic status and has indicated she would have a prophylactic mastectomy if she is found to be positive. The other daughter does not want to know her genetic status and will pursue screening based on family history alone. Genetic counseling is both extremely rewarding and extremely challenging, and I think this is a great example of both. We often find ourselves in the middle of very complex and difficult situations, oftentimes involving multiple family members, and oftentimes involving very difficult emotions like guilt and blame. Mostly, we see love between family, and it is a tremendous privilege for me to be able to help families through those situations. Genetics is continuing to expand. In fact, 10 new genetic tests are added to the market every single day. Genetics will continue to grow, and I promise it will affect all of us to one degree or another over the course of our lives. I hope you consider reaching out to a genetic counselor who can help you navigate all that information and often difficult situations. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>